Good afternoon from what I assume is a snowy virtual Davos and good morning from Washington, D.C. My name is Ishan Tharoor. I'm, I'm, a call, I'm a foreign affairs columnist here at the Washington Post. And it's a real privilege to be your moderator today, accompanied by a distinguished panel of global leaders for a session where we, we will be honing in on social justice in the recovery, something that cuts at the heart of this week's agenda in Davos, the idea of a great global reset uh, as we reckon with the consequences and the aftermath of the pandemic. We've all experienced this past year as a series of compounding crises, a once in a century global, global health crisis provoked both unforeseen economic contractions, but also revealed deep systemic inequities in societies everywhere from countries that we classify as low income to ones where, well, to, to the wealthiest country in the world. Uh, the pandemic, among other things, exposed gaps in social safety nets, failures in global governance and fiscal policy, and of course, the need for greater racial justice. So how do we work through these challenges? And how do we ensure that the recovery does not just simply take us back to the status quo ante? To, do, to, to talk through this, I'm delighted to be joined by a, a, a panel of global leaders on the front lines of this struggle and you know, with, the, with the real solutions for these questions. Uh, I'm joined by Gabriela Boucher, Executive Director of, of Oxfam International, Sadi Khan, the Mayor of London, Anissa Kamadoli Costa, Chairman and President of the Tiffany & Co Foundation, as well as the Chief Sustainability Officer at Tiffany & Co, and Darren Walker, president of, president of the Ford Foundation, one of the preeminent and global philanthropic organizations. Gabriella, let's start with you. Every year, Oxfam comes to Davos with a report on global inequality. You, you guys act something like a kind of town crier among the global elites. Uh, it's, the report is always rather grim reading, but this year in particular, because of the pandemic, it has some pretty stark revelations. I was wondering if you could set the stage for us uh, on, on, your, on Oxfam's findings and, and what, that, what the implications are for a recovery thereafter. Thanks, Isham. I, I would like really to talk about how equality has to be at the heart of social justice. And this year we've presented the report, The Inequality Virus. And many of us, when we think about inequality, we think this is something just for idealists or an inconvenience to the serious business of capitalism. But Oxfam's message is, no, actually, equality is a fresh and moral and serious framework that can reshape the way we run our economies for the 21st century. Equality in our economy will drive us towards achieving the global goals that governments around the world agreed to. And it's crucial to fighting the climate breakdown. And let me say, we're paying for the profound failure of governments to address inequality. Oxfam is at Davos, as you say, this year with new data. It shows that we risk facing the greatest rise in inequality since records began. And it could take more than a decade for billions of people to recover from the economic hit of the pandemic. While at the very top, just 10 billionaires, all men, have seen their wealth skyrocket by half a trillion dollars since March. That could have paid to vaccinate the world and prevent anyone from being pushed into poverty by the pandemic. We also show the deadly impact of systemic racism and patriarchy. Nearly 22,000 Black and Hispanic people in the U.S. would still be alive today if their COVID-19 mortality rates were the same as white people. 22,000 people. So you ask for solution, Ishan, and we'll get there shortly, won't we? But let me say that first that tinkering at the edges won't do. We need to end extreme inequality and abolish gender and racial inequality at the very core of our economic strategy. Mayor Khan, I'd like to bring you in now. Um, you are, of course, in charge of one of the world's most important cities, a crossroads of humanity, an engine of business in Europe and the West. Uh, what have you seen uh, over the course of the pandemic? Uh, what have you seen in terms of the inequities exposed within your city? And 
how are you hoping to redress those inequities going forward? Well, Ishan, it's lovely to join you. And uh, can I just say, I fully agree with almost every word Gabriella said, and I'm looking forward to hearing from Anissa and Darren shortly. I'm the mayor, uh, in my view, of the greatest city in the world. Uh, we are a global city. Uh, we think our diversity is a strength. We don't simply tolerate difference. We respect it, we embrace it, and we uh, celebrate it. One of the things that, that Gabriella talked about, which is really important, is what this pandemic has done is not simply expose the structural inequalities in our society. I would argue we are the most progressive city in the world. Even being so, uh, this pandemic has exposed uh, those structural inequalities, uh, but it's exacerbated them as well. Uh, what do I mean by that? If you're a black male Londoner, you're four times more likely to have lost your life than if you're a white male Londoner. If you're a mother, you're 50% more likely to have lost your job than if you're a father. And so I've experienced what the IMF is talking about when the IMF says, if we're not careful, we could undo 30 years of progress made around gender equality. And uh, Ishan, you'll hear uh, phrases like build back better being used by not just the new president of the USA. I can actually smile when I say president of the USA now, rather than frown or, uh, or, be, or, or be intimidated into cowering. Uh, but actually it means a new normal, a new normal where we have a just recovery. And, and I hate using the word opportunity when it comes to a global pandemic, but Gabriela is spot on. We've got to use this horrible pandemic as an opportunity to reset, and in your words, reboot our economies across the globe. And that means not just government, but also civic society, uh, the business community, the faith community, and others working together to address some of the inequalities we've talked about for too many years on an annual basis at Davos. Well, to turn to the business community, uh, Anissa, Tiffany's, of course, is a major international uh, brand, uh, a company with uh, supply chains arcing around the world. What has the pandemic taught you over the past year and revealed to you about the nature of your business? And since you are tasked with uh, sustainability, um, how are you hoping to adapt uh, uh, both the functioning of Tiffany and how do you hope the private sector can change or adapt going forward? No, thank you, Ishan. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today along with my fellow panelists. Look, we all know that we're living in an extremely interconnected and interdependent world, and we can't afford to think or to work in silos. And as a business community, it's critical for us to address issues such as climate equity and social and environmental justice in a collaborative and integrated manner. So it's not just about reducing your greenhouse gas emissions or working on the diversity of your workforce. Of course, these actions are critical, but businesses must think more broadly and at the same time more deeply. And they have to constantly be connecting the dots between all of these areas. And the intersectionality of these views is, is really what's important. So I think that there are three things, very briefly, that will be crucial for the business community to be doing to contribute to a just recovery. The first, is listening to different voices and giving them a seat at the table. So it's critical to bring in those different voices, external voices, to better inform what businesses do and how we should work so that we go beyond business as usual. And truly listening to the perspective of communities, whether local or global, is going to make business stronger and enable greater positive impact. And you know, this is something at Tiffany that we've long done communicating and, and really deeply engaging with indigenous peoples and community organizations and NGOs. Um, but this same principle applies internally as well, right? We're living in an era of employee activism where businesses that are going to be successful in the long term will be listening to and learning from employees across the organization, regardless of level, regardless of title or geography. The second is that business should champion and advance what I would consider true multi-stakeholder efforts. I've long believed in the importance of multi-stakeholder efforts. And to be clear, when I say that, this means that an initiative takes all stakeholders into account from the beginning and gives them a voice as well as a seat at the table. And true multi-stakeholder initiatives are not about just consultation, right? And frankly, we see a lot of the, the just consultation, but they're about co-creation. And so that's why as a purchaser of, of 
um, and a consumer of mined materials, we've been championing an effort that, that maybe I can talk about later called the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. But in short, it is an, an entity that um, has NGOs, labor unions, affected communities, mining companies, and then downstream businesses such as Tiffany with an equal seat at the table when it comes to governance. And what that does is it leads to a stronger standards that all stakeholders have had a voice in and are represented by. And traditional standards, you know, traditionally have just consulted with stakeholders, but it doesn't necessarily mean that their views are incorporated. Um, so maybe we'll have time later to get to that, but my, I wanna make sure that, um, that I just highlight my third and final point, which is that businesses are speaking out, but it's critical that they're backing up their words with action. So in my time at Tiffany, we've long used the power of our voice and brand to speak out on issues ranging from responsible mining to climate change to human rights. And what we've seen over this past year is that this must be the norm for business, not the exception. But most importantly, it is not simply about speaking out. It cannot be greenwashing or performative allyship. You cannot put something up on an Instagram page without having the appropriate underlying work be in place. And what's important and what everyone is looking for, and I'm glad and I, I hopefully people will be held to account, is for authenticity. And that includes not only what actions businesses are and have been doing, but taking um, and also looking at what new and increased actions they're going to be taking looking forward. This issue of uh, the private sector, the private sector speaking out, uh, Darren. If I can turn to you, you know, here in the U.S., our experience of the pandemic was so punctuated in the summer by the explosion of protests uh, following the killing of George Floyd. Uh, I was wondering if you could perhaps venture into what the impact of those protests were in the context of the pandemic. We had a public health and, and social crisis compounded by uh, a deep historical wound being resurfaced in America. And, and is it important when we think of a just recovery to, to think of these things together? Thank you, Ishan. And it's a great honor for me to be with you, my friends, uh, Anissa and Gabriela, and of course, the great mayor, what an honor for me to be here. Before jumping into the challenge of what happens in a post-George Floyd world, a world for corporations where we are being held to account, I want to just make sure we remember who the audience at Davos is. The audience at Davos are the world's greatest capitalists. Now, I am a capitalist because I believe that capitalism is the best way to organize an economy. But I also have a point of view that if capitalism is to be sustained, we must intentionally put a nail in the coffin of the ideology of the last 50 years propagated first and foremost by Milton Friedman and others who used the Friedman ideology as scaffolding to allow the kind of and propel the kind of inequality that Gabriella has spoken about this morning. So we must put the nail in the coffin first. Secondly, we must recognize that the challenge of white supremacy, as difficult as it is to talk about it, is real. Patriarchy is real in our capitalist systems. And if we want a more just recovery, we have to acknowledge that there was a, in my view, I organized things sort of in time and space, and there was a BC world. Before coronavirus, there was a world. That world is over. Doesn't mean that we've lost everything in that world. It just means that many of the norms and structures and understandings of that world in a post-coronavirus world, in a PC world, must be reorganized, reimagined, and dismantled. And so the issue of white supremacy, of patriarchy, must be acknowledged in the boardroom as part of a diagnosis of recovery. Because without acknowledging it, we will engage in the kinds of things that Anissa was just speaking of, the performative acts of which we saw 
some Academy Award winning quality performances by leaders of corporations who are not following through. And so we now have to ask ourselves, how do we move beyond the statements of Black Lives Matter to looking at the boardroom and asking ourselves, how can it be that one third of the S&P 500 does not even have one African-American on its board? How would a company with that composition of a board be able to authentically implement, execute on, and sustain diversity as a value. So we have work to do, we capitalists, if we believe in capitalism and if we believe in justice. These are not irreconcilable ideas. And stakeholder capitalism, of course, is the watchword uh, of this week, or the watch phrase of this week here in Davos. Darren, if I could stick with you, could you talk a bit more, perhaps, as we knuckle down into some of the solutions that we're venturing uh, in the months ahead, could you talk a bit more about uh, some arenas of progress that you've seen or that you hope to help affect uh, going forward in the United States, um, whether it's with uh, ways in which the, public sec uh, the private sector can lobby or be more effective, or ways in which uh, certain political leaders can take more proactive action alongside civil society. Uh, I'm sure the Ford Foundation is at the heart of so many of these conversations. Well, we're very lucky to be investing in a, a, a major initiative on the future of workers, because for us, it's not about the future of work. It is about the future of workers. And will they have uh, security? Uh, will they have a safety net? So the policies that support workers we need more policies like paid sick days, like the ways in which uh, companies are reimagining ownership. What happened to those uh, employee stock ownership corporations? They went away. Well, they went away because of an ideology that all of the profits of a company belong to the shareholders, not employees. So we have a system where employees no longer are owners of their company. So we need to restructure our economy to have more mechanisms for employee ownership. It's something we are supporting. We're also looking at the fundamental issue of investments. How do we invest our endowment at the Ford Foundation? Because investors, asset managers have power in the marketplace. So we have to use the marketplace. We have to also ask some fundamental questions about the allocation of capital and labor. And how do we and how have we come to a circumstance of a race to the bottom to pay people as little as we can and inure to the benefit of people like me, people who have assets, people who are able to invest in the market and for whom my privilege is compounded why, while the disadvantage of frontline workers, essential workers, their disadvantage is compounded in our system. So we have to, at the corporate board level, CEOs and boards have to ask some fundamental questions and not just assume that every dollar that is available has to always be allocated to repurchase shares. Let's have some fundamental questions about what is the right allocation of share repurchases versus capital expenditures and operating expenditures in our capital structures as corporate entities. So these are fundamental things that happen actually behind the curtain. And it's time for us to bring some transparency to those decisions. And it will happen when you put more diverse people at the board table when you put representatives of workers at the board table. Anissa, are those conversations that are happening at a company like Tiffany, and what does stakeholder capitalism look like there? Yes, I mean, you know, years ago, companies used to follow legislation, but of course, laws 
are uneven globally. And so what you've seen over the past number of years are companies sort of leading by creating their own standards, right? And I think that that is good when they are leading standards. But again, to uh, to Darren's point, to, to points I made earlier and, and that Gabriella and the mayor made earlier, you need to make sure that you're having an inclusive conversation. And that means from the top down, so as Darren said, from a governance, the board down and from the bottom up and from an external perspective, right? So you need to make sure that you're, you're including and listening to an inclusive set of voices as a business since now business has had to create and set higher bar standards as we move forward. Mayor Khan, I have two questions for you, uh, if I may. Uh, of course, you've experienced the pandemic in London in a rather fraught political moment as well as Brexit uh, was carried out. Could you talk a bit about, uh, first, you know, what the experience of, uh, of, of going through Brexit was in the middle of this global health crisis? Yeah, of course I can. Well, first, I guess, just follow on the, one of the points that Darren made, which is uh, we mustn't assume that the horrific killing of George Floyd only had an impact on Minnesota to Minneapolis, the USA. The ripples of the horrific killing are felt around the world. And one of the things, Darren, we've, we've uh, needed to do uh, this summer is to not just be uh, you know, activists in the sense of the Black Lives Matter movement, but allies of this issue, because it is a fact whether you're in America, London, or elsewhere across the globe, if you are black, your life chances are far less than you are at any other ethnicity. Racism, inequality, and discrimination suffered by black people in 2021 in the mo most progressive city in the world is still unacceptable. And that acknowledgement that Darren talked about has been, taken, has been taking place across the business community, civic society, politics, uh, and the rest. And so if you imagine, Ishan, we're dealing with, in our bandwidth, uh, this awful pandemic. We've got uh, the fact that the pandemic is exposing and exacerbating structural inequalities. You've got the Black Lives Matter movement, which is really important, exposing racism, inequality, and, and discrimination against black people. And then you have uh, self-inflicted trauma caused by Brexit. Uh, and so you can understand why my government didn't quite do the deal with the EU that was the best deal possible. I'm somebody who, of course, didn't want to leave the European Union. We are we are. In my view, uh, we need to be multilateralists. We need to be working together. Uh, we need to be pooling our resources that I'm afraid, Ishan, the timing of Brexit couldn't have been worse. We have left the European Union. So my job, job as mayor of this great city is to make sure that I continue to amplify the underlying strengths our city has, which aren't going to change where we are on the timeline, our geography, the language, our unique ecosystem, our diversity, uh, the financial sector, uh, the universities, the life sciences, the tech, creative industries, and so forth. But it's going to be a challenge, Sean. And that's why uh, when we began the conversation, we talked about a new normal rebooting. And I think there are opportunities here. And one of the great things about the conversations I'm hearing from friends in the business community like Darren and Anissa but also civic society like Gabriella, are the conversations we're having in London. I've brought together in London uh, uh, key players from the business community, government, uh, faith community, civic society, to work together on what should be our missions going forward. And colleagues can go to any search engine uh, to, 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 to type in the London Recovery Board and look at the nine missions we've chosen, which touch upon the things that Gabriella, Darren, and Anissa have talked about I'll give you one example, Ishan, digital inequality. This conference is taking place virtually, but in our respective cities, think about those members of our society who haven't got the right connectivity, haven't got the right devices, haven't got the right skill set. And the same goes for not just meeting each other, but jobs for the future, skills for the future. And we've got to have the humility as uh, uh, politicians to accept we haven't got all the solutions. And, and we're seeing in London, the business community also with humility saying that, civic society saying that, uh, uh, the faith community saying that, but us pooling our resources. I love the way Anissa described it. We've got to be getting them involved in the design phase, in the implementation phase, in the execution phase, and we're doing that. And we've hotwired uh, our DNA, Ishan, to make sure we're fully utilizing uh, the, the full talent pool that exists across our city. 
Uh, just to, to, to stick with that for one for one more question to you, uh, you know, the past half decade we've seen a certain I mean, a certain kind of ascendant nationalism in the West, uh, but the experience of the pandemic, and of course the the fundamental reality of the climate threat facing the planet, and indeed also the question of uh, social and economic inequities around the world, do not have national only national solutions. Uh, what what role do cities, and especially cities of the scale like London and the importance of London, what role do cities have um, as engines of finding these solutions and driving change? Well, our, our world is becoming more urbanized. More and more people are moving to live in cities. Uh, and one of the things that I'm a big subscriber to is, uh, is uh, something said by a former American mayor, which is if the 19th century was renowned for a century of empires, the 20th century as a century for nation states. The 21st century is going to be about cities and mayors. That's where the action is. I'll give you one example, Ishan, outside our direct control. Uh, but if you look at who has been standing up to the rise of nativist populist movements around the globe, not just from the United States of America, 2016 onwards, up until recently, but Hungary, uh, uh, Poland, uh, Brazil, uh, Philippines, Italy, some parts of France and the UK, it's been the peoples and leaders of cities uh, standing up to the rise of native populist movements. And our job is to address the legitimate fears people have in our cities and in urban parts of our countries as well. And the, the best antidote in recent times has been the election of uh, President uh, Joe Biden in America, how it's possible to address people's fears, how it's possible to take up those who are subscribers and advocates of nativist populist movements and win. And if I may say so, Ishan, the way the US uh, constitutions uh, withstood the challenges is uh, something that many of us look in awe at. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why you are a beacon to uh, other parts of the world. Gabriella, I'd love to bring you in now. You've heard some of the, the, the discussion here about uh, solutions to some of these very thorny questions of inequity that have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, is there any obvious or you know, blindingly necessary solution that governments can take specifically uh, going forward? Feeling um, to in this panel, everybody I feel is listening to each other and it's and and reflecting on each other and it's the what each of of our panelists have been talking about is the interconnectedness and the really appreciation of diversity means listening to each other in this deep way and um, I think Anissa also spoke of co-creation and I believe this the the way in which we do this transformation is as important as the as the end itself and we we need to sort of end this polarization and, and be much more conscious of our interconnectedness. And I, I believe that's how we start building and, and recovering differently. I think one thing that is de definitely very pressing precisely in this interconnectedness is the issue of, of vaccines. So it's a critical inequality issue at this moment. So um, rich countries are currently you know, making their greatest efforts to, to get their populations vaccinated as soon as possible. But we know there's an issue of availability of vaccines. And basically, the majority of the world is being left out. So one in nine people in developing countries is likely to miss out on a vaccine. And that's a recipe for inequality and, and really self-defeating for the recovery. So we are not alone in one country or another. It needs everybody to, to work together. And we really need to have governments ensure that there is no monopoly on a, on a COVID-19 vaccine. So that's very important. And then at this moment also, how do we also make sure that this right to health that uh, we've all said is, is denied because of issues of racism and sexism in many countries, how do we ensure that people get care irrespective of the color of their skin or the cash in their purse? And that we really achieve universal health care, like middle-income Costa Rica pulled it off in, in a decade. So, and also how do we actually fund this fairer future that we're all talking about? So for this, we need to, to think of taxing differently. And, and this, in this area, Argentina is leading the way with a one-off wealth tax to fund the COVID recovery. Um, but we think this should be now the norm. So we, we can't think of 
uh, small adjustments. We really need to see how we're going to fund a fair and just recovery that is really redistributing at the same time as, as it enables all, all participants of the economy to be active. And uh, as Darren was saying, we need action to ensure workers' rights and also that unions have a seat at the table and that business is therefore um, benefit from these different perspectives. And, and uh, we had the example last week from Unilever that we partner with how they've just backed a living wage for, uh, for everybody across the supply chain. And that's, that's really huge. And I think the, the quote from the Unilever CEO saying, without healthy societies, there is no healthy business, tells us how we are, you know, we can't think of one without the other. And, and this is um, the type of action that we need everybody to take on. And following the movement of Black Lives Matter or New Namenos and see how we can bring um, anti-racist and and gender equality into, into the core of what we do into our new 21st century economy. Gabriela, that's perfect. I think you, you really put a lot down on the table. Thank you so much for joining this you know, terrific panel. And this is just the start of a very, very important conversation as we move ahead. Thank you again.